Take courage, you can conquer the world. We now come to the concluding talk of our circuit assembly. We're going to have a very interesting discussion on what is needed to stay away from the world. What tools do we have at our disposal to deal with the threats from this system of things? We will also consider some things that are necessary on our part if we are to remain no part of the world. Our district overseer, Brother Sutter, is going to talk to us on the subject. Take courage, you can conquer the world. Brother Sutter. So do we have to make a choice, conquer the world? Do we have to choose? Sure, we have to choose. We have to make a choice. Life is full of choices, isn't it? I mean, we have to choose just basic little things, what to wear, what to eat, all those things we had to do today, whether we were going to come or not, that's a choice. You know, some choices in the world though that we have to make, some are not just a little thing and a very important thing. It's really easy to see the important and the mundane or not so important. Where the problem comes is the real important and the real important, now we have to choose between these things. That's the hard part. You know there was a news item where a woman locked her baby in the back seat of her car, by accident, and it was a very hot day. And she just panicked because she was trying to figure out how to get the kid out and the keys were in the car and she couldn't get it out and she ran next door and got her neighbor and got a coat hanger trying to come in and get it. By this time the baby is turning blue, starting to foam at the mouth, and she doesn't know what to do and this man in a wrecker comes driving by, looks at the situation, sees what it is, and pulls up beside them, jumps out of his car with a hammer, bangs in the back window and gets the child out. You would think he would be a hero, who? Nope. The woman was mad at him for breaking the window of her car. The driver of the wrecker said, what is more important, the window or the baby? That's an easy one, isn't it? At least it would appear that way, but it wasn't for the woman. It wasn't easy for her. So when it comes to taking courage, we're going to conquer the world. It's, okay, what am I going to do? How am I going to do that? It's a choice that I had to make because a lot of calls are easy, but this one is not so easy because we're going to face temptations and persecutions and trials. And we know why we have to deal with those. If Adam and Eve had just done what they were supposed to do, we wouldn't have to worry about it. But we do. So we are in a fight and we are going to have to endure and that's what Brother Weaver said earlier. But now here in John chapter 16, verse 33, notice what is going to happen but also why we can be positive about our decision to serve God. It's the last verse of that chapter. At John 16, 33 Jesus says, I have said these things to you that by means of me you have peace. So now that's the good part of it. So we're going to have peace. That's nice. We are Christians and we're going to have peace. And then he says, in the world you are having tribulation. Okay so now we're going to have tribulation. In trying to be Christians we're going to have tribulation. But take courage, I have conquered the world. So Jesus conquered the world but he also knew and it's obvious that he knew his disciples were going to have problems. If he didn't think they were going to have problems it wouldn't be written there. So he requested that his father watch over his disciples in John 17 15 he said I request you not to take them out of the world but to watch over them because of the wicked one. So he knew Satan the devil would cause difficulties for us. Jesus made requests for his eleven apostles, he made requests not, not only for them, but for us too, those putting faith in him and his father and because in John 17 he said, they are not part of the world. So we're no part of the world, so that's why we're going to have difficulties, but we can take courage that things are going to change. But what enables us to take courage? What allows us to be separate? Well when Jesus talked about it, in the Hebrew scriptures they were called the truth, in the Greek scriptures they were called the truth. What would the truth do? It would sanctify, it would make holy, it would set apart, it would change our life completely. Hasn't it done that, changed our life? Sure. It's changed all of us. So that in itself, because of the truth, separates us from the rest of mankind. So we know that Jesus was concerned about his followers, he prayed for them, John 17, but we also know that his father loved him and wanted to look after him, protect him, take care of him. Jesus made the comment that, you, talking to his father, he said, you loved me before the founding of the world. Now the founding of the world was when Adam and Eve first had a child. Even before that, Jehovah loved his son, and that's why Jesus told us that we have to love him and love the Father just as the Father loved him and us. So we're grateful for that, but at the same time, it is going to cost something. We are going to have to pay something. 
It may not be monetarily, but it's something that we may have to pay as far as our being persecuted or whatever the case might be. In John chapter 17 continuing a little further, he said to his followers, I made your name known, that he had made his father's name known. Now obviously the disciples knew Jesus but they also knew Jehovah and they knew the name, that wasn't an issue. But Jesus made the name known to other people. And you think about that, you know there are a lot of us here today that when we first started studying the Bible or first came to our door even, and they started talking about God's name being Jehovah, man, that was a revelation. We didn't know God had a name. They said, what is God's name? And we would say, Jesus, you know, like we knew something. But we really didn't, but we thought we did. And then we tried all these other things, but we never came around to Jehovah. Once we knew that God had a name, now that makes sense because now we have a father, now we have somebody we can get close to. So when Jesus said he made his name known, then he made it known so that those individuals who knew God knew, knew Jehovah and knew his son could hold their ground in whatever circumstances they would find themselves. But here's the problem, we can succeed in one sort of trial and then fail in another trial. For example, we may not be materialistic, we don't watch bad movies, we don't play video games that are aggressive or warlike, but then we listen to music that's debasing. So it's a matter of our whole life, not just a portion of it, we call that double-hearted or living two lives or whatever, but it's our whole life. The truth has changed our whole way of thinking. So we endure because we want to please our creator, but that endurance, what's the key? I mean, how does a person endure? How do they put up with all these things? And it's really very simple. Well it's simple to say, the implementation is the hard part, if we're going to endure, we have to be obedient. That's all, just we have to be obedient. The question we ask ourselves is, how quick are we to obey the things God's word commands? How quick are we? Now if a loving and wise father is walking through the woods with his child and he sees a poisonous mushroom and he says to his child, I don't eat mushrooms like that, they're poisonous, they'll kill me. The kid looks at it and says, I don't eat them either. Why not? Well, because dad said he doesn't eat them. Now if dad says, I don't eat mushrooms because they'll kill me, and I don't want you eating them either. Now he has two reasons for not eating the mushrooms, one, because his dad doesn't, and two, because dad told him not to. Well now God's organization gives us direction and we have examples, we look at them and we say, okay, I'm not going to do that because of this example. But we're also told, here, you don't do this or you don't do that, here's the way we act and here's the way we don't act. So it's not just example, we have rules and regulations, so how quick are we to obey the things that God's word says? And a part of that is the organization giving us direction that we need to help us to deal with the obstacles and the pressures and the problems we see and so we're willing and we obey. And sometimes, friends, we're told something, we read something, or we are given some kind of direction and we say, I don't have a clue what this is about. Well, that's too bad. If it's from the Bible and from God's organization and we don't understand, we do it anyway and then later on we're going to find out why. Because in reality, we got here didn't we? Who got us this far? We would have never had an understanding of the Bible without the organization, without the faithful slave and the governing body, we would have never made it on our own. So now we just have confidence in what God's word says and we can benefit from that and it's going to, as it gives us direction, we're going to be assisted to endure. That's what James said. James said, consider it all a joy my brothers when you meet with various trials. So there are going to be various trials that we're going to have to deal with, but he said, this is proof of your faith. So we start out on the Christian course, we are obedient. We don't want to give up. We want to continue. There are going to be temptations, there are going to be desires of the flesh, pressures from others, things outside, things inside, sexual immorality, excessive drinking, use of drugs, tobacco, those are all tests. Now some of us we can say, well I would never get involved in that. Well there have been some that said I'd never get involved in that and they did get involved. Because they felt like I'm really strong here, no. No. Let God take care of that. We rely on our creator. First Peter chapter 4 verses 1 and 2 says of us world conquerors, therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, you too arm yourselves with the same mental disposition. Do we have the mental disposition of Christ? Then we're going to desist, it says, from sins 
to the end that he may live the remainder of his time in the flesh no more for the desires of men, but for God's will. So we've accepted Christianity, haven't we? We've accepted the way that Jesus lived his life and perhaps there are things that we've already suffered, things that we've already had to deal with and in time all of us may have to deal with some difficulties. So how do we know that we can endure? How do we know that? Well, from time to time what we do is just test ourselves. And how do we do that? Well, we ask ourselves some questions and then we try to figure out, okay here's the answer, and then deal with it. Now we're going to ask a few questions, so I'm going to ask some questions and what I would suggest that you do is you look straight at me or look at your feet, or your shoestrings, or the floor, or the head of the person in front of you, but you can't look sideways because, if you twitch or if you jerk in any way with one of these questions, people around you are going to know, oh ho, that's their problem. Laughter. So I would suggest somehow concentrating on something so that you don't twitch, please. Laughter. Okay. And then just go home, put a little asterisk there and a little note or something, and then go home, and say, now I've got to adjust this, I'm going to change this now. And nobody has to know. Are you ready? Okay here we go, are you maintaining faithfulness now? Now what that means is that when the organization says to us, we don't watch movies or videos that are violent, reading material, we don't get involved in that kind of activity, then we don't get involved in that kind of activity. So that means we're maintaining our faithfulness. How about are we regularly studying God's word now? Okay now what that means is we've been told that we should have a family worship night. Now what's happening is that we're hearing that family worship night is not really a family worship night, that some of the friends are not doing that. They just have a night off. So they're doing other things. Now the governing body has spent a lot of time, years, as a matter of fact, figuring out okay what are we going to do here so we can keep our friends spiritually upbuilt. We'll set one night aside, we'll combine the other meetings, and we'll put one for them to have family worship. So don't make it complicated. Some of the brothers, I don't really have time for this, but I'm going to tell you anyway, some of the brothers made this really complicated, you know, here we go to a book study on Tuesday night, we have the school and service meeting on Thursday night, and then we get this thing and we're going to start the family worship night, and they're scratching their head trying to figure out, okay, what night can we have family worship night, what night? I mean, what's the big deal? Tuesday night was when we had our book study, what is all this thinking about, just have it Tuesday night. You know, don't make it elaborate. We were gone, we had to dress up, we had to get ready to go, we had to get the kids ready to go to the meeting, we had to drive, we had to drive home, we've got all kinds of time now. Tuesday night, 7 o'clock, we have our family worship night. What's so tough about that one? Not at all. Don't make it complicated, we just need to do it, that's all. Alright now another question, do we get not merely the milk of God's word, the primary doctrines, we understand those and we come into the truth with them and we understand them, are we getting more accurate knowledge? Are we getting discernment so that we can make right decisions? And as we talked about yesterday, can we see where we're headed and, if we make a particular decision today, can we see where it's going to take us tomorrow? At the present time, are we putting ourselves out for others? Or do we hesitate to inconvenience ourselves? Now we know that's an issue with God's organization. Do you know how we know that is an issue that we're willing to put ourselves out for others? Do you know what that has come up? Did you see the brother this morning that was right here? He thought he was really a good guy, do you know that? He's just really good because of Jack, he was a nice guy to Jack and everybody thought he was just a wonderful fellow. And then he thought about it and he had a sister who wanted a ride and he didn't want to have anything to do with it. So apparently that is an issue. So do we go out of our way for our friends? Now remember James chapter 1, verse 27, says, The form of worship that is clean and undefiled from God's standpoint is to look after orphans and widows. That's what it says. Look after orphans and widows. Now it would really be a mistake for us to lower our moral spiritual standards, maybe thinking that we're strong enough that we can resist bad association. It's okay, you can look around now. We're done with the questions, so you don't have to worry about it anymore. Well, maybe some, but no. So we want to be careful because we're looking today at a society that violence and immoral entertainment is the norm, it's not the minority, it's the majority. So we need to protect ourselves. 
We need to protect our children, our families. You think about it, most of us have a computer and we go to such lengths to make sure our computer isn't take over by some virus. I mean, we have free antivirus that we have to pay for and we put it on our machine and when it boots up it goes through all this gymnastics to make sure that nothing comes in, and when we get email, it does all of this, and we are just real concerned because we don't want our computer take on over or use by someone else, to take over someone else's computer. Now if we do all of that, why shouldn't we be as concerned about protecting our family? Who? We've got to take care of our family. We don't want them to be infected by the crafty acts of Satan the devil. So practically every day, every day we have to make choices. Are we going to do things Jehovah's way or not? Whether it's school or work or whatever. We have to make a choice. Now something else we might think about just to let you parents and some of you young people think about it. There is something going on in school now that you may or may not be aware of. And I don't want you to raise your hand on this although it would be kind of fun if you did. But you don't have to, please. Does anyone know what K2 is? Just do this if you do. Do you know what K2 is? If you don't you'd better find out if you parents. Don't find out from your parents, because your parents probably don't know. It is if you are parents, you need to find out. So do you know what huffing is? You've got to find out. K2 is a kind of an incense that is used to cover marijuana when they're smoking it. They also are able to get high on K2 and that's why they're trying to ban it in this state. I'm not sure if they have, there was this big stink about it, excuse the expression, a few months ago. That wasn't meant, by the way. But the kids now, I was talking to a lady that called the Kingdom Hall and happened to come into where we were staying, and she was a teacher and she said that they're having kids at her school that are huffing this cake too and it's killing them. She said they've had some deaths in their school. So when it comes to making choices, our children need to make choices every day, they need the help of the elders, the congregation, the mummies, the daddies, but we as adults have to know what's going on with our kids. So talk to them about it because those choices, some of them are obviously not really big ones that we have to worry about, but some could kill us. So if we're going to gain salvation, we have to obey God now, live our life by his righteous principles. See it's either we're going to be obedient to death or to the end of the system of things, that's the way it's going to work for all of us. But Jehovah is going to reward us. Jesus promised that, he that has endured to the end is the one that will be saved. So we have to develop courage. If we're going to endure, we have to be courageous. Mahatma Gandhi made a comment, now he lived between 1869 and 1948, in a publication called The Young India on April 13, 1921, he made this comment, fearlessness is the first requisite of spirituality. Cowards can never be moral. Do you get it? Good. You see, we have to remember that we may win a single battle, that doesn't mean we've won the war. We conquer through our life each day. On the other hand if we lose one battle, that doesn't mean we have lost the war either. Even when we fall, we make mistakes, we don't quit, we get up and we keep going. Falling is not the sin. Staying there is the sin. So we get up. We fight for our faith until the end of the system. But we obviously are surrounded by the attitudes, the conduct of the world, and we need to be courageous and resist the contamination, moral, social, financial, religious, family. You see, in education today, they trying to teach our children all kinds of things that are incorrect. I mean they really pushing now for evolution. They have organizations that are pushing it. So we can't just kind of say, well I'll hunker down and I'll make it. No, no. We have to be proactive and help one another because we have the example of Christ Jesus and those early disciples. Jesus said, in the world you are having tribulation. But take courage, I have conquered the world. You see, he never yielded to the influences of the world. He never allowed the world to stop him from doing what he was supposed to do, he never lowered his standards. There was a certain way of life that he lived. And we can too. Now something that might help us, if we just take one of the illustrations that Paul used to the Episcian friends, and we just kind of go through it, and it's not like this is the first time we've ever heard of this because we have. We're going to look at Episcians chapter 6. So let's open our Bible to Ephesians chapter 6 and verses 10 through 19 is the illustration. We're not going to read all of it, but it's talking about how we can defend ourselves against the system of things. It's talking about wearing the armor, because we are in a war. And that's why it's necessary if we're going to be able to take courage, 
conquer the world, then we have to use the provisions that are made for us. Now what we're going to do is we're going to look at Epicians chapter 6, and we're going to go through verses 14 through 17, so you can just leave your Bibles open there, and, if it's alright, we could read the whole thing, but it might be a little confusing, let's just read the verses one at a time if that's alright with everybody. At Epicians 6.14 Paul begins, We stand firm therefore with loins girded about with truth. Now first of all we need to know what are the loins. The loins are kind of in back here. Now when you gird up the loins, have you ever gone to Walmart or one of these places where they're doing some heavy lifting, they take this thing and they put it around their back and then they take, and some of you brothers probably or sisters do it, and they take a little velcro and strip it on tight. Well, weightlifters do the same thing. Weightlifters use about an 8 inch leather belt, put it on, strap it up, so they won't blow an organ or something. Because when they're heavy lifting, they can do some damage to internal organs. But here in Latin the influence for this is that, girding up the loins, mean work. So when Paul says, to gird up the loins, what he is helping us to do is to see that we're going to work. But how close is that thing that girds around us? It's very close, it's very tight. That's the way the truth should be with us. It should be very close to us. When we have questions and difficulties, problems, what does the Bible say? What does the truth tell us? Now in verse 14, the second part it says, having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now that breastplate was something that protected a vital organ, the heart. And the heart is a fitting symbol here when it says it is protecting our heart because what comes out of our heart, feelings, thoughts, opinions, desires, wishes, it's really what motivates us, inside is what motivates us. We have to protect what motivates us. So some of this stuff coming in from the world, it can't come into our heart. If it comes into our heart, it's going to change the way we act as Christians. And Satan doesn't want us to put on the breastplate. What he wants us to do is expose our heart to all this wickedness that is around us and then we make another decision, but it's the wrong decision. Now in verse 15, it says, with your feet shod with the equipment of the good news of peace. Now what that verse is all about is how we use our feet. Do our feet take us into the ministry? That's what it is talking about. Now granted, there are going to people who are not nice, they are unkind, they are indifferent, they are antagonistic, they are hostile, they don't like us, okay, that's fine. We're still going to persevere. The devil does not want us to use our feet, he wants our feet to be in a hurry to do badness. He wants us to go in another direction. That's why we keep busy in the work. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 15, says, Have plenty to do in the work of the Lord. That makes us steady, unmovable, and it really is a wonderful protection for us. We're going to look back here at this system when we get in the new one and say, Man, I'm sure glad I was out in the service because I could have done some really dumb things. And we all could. Now in verse 16, it says, Take up the large shield of faith. Now can you imagine a soldier at that time going out in the field to fight someone without this shield? There are spears and arrows and things flying around. This thing is from the ground all the way over the top of his head. A guy could be seriously wounded or killed. But what does that do for us? Well for us, it helps us with persecution, deceptive worldly philosophies, materialistic attractions, temptations, and so we don't want that. When we're standing behind this large shield, we don't want to have any body part hanging out to one side, do we? Or over the top, we take a peek and get it in the head. Come on, we want to be protected. So our relationship with God is protected because we're able to fend off these things that the Bible says are burning missiles that come from Satan the devil. Now in verse 17, it says, accept the helmet of salvation. Now consider what the helmet does, it protects a vital part of our body, our brain. But the soldier in Bible times wore a helmet made of either copper, iron or leather. Now if it was copper or iron, they usually put something in there and some of those bald guys know why because if you wore it without any kind of felt or lamps wool or something, you'd lose all your hair. That's what happened to me, I was a soldier and had a thing. Laughter. I'm kidding, you know better than that. But this helmet is simply there to help us to ward off the blows of Satan the devil and to protect our head, our brain, our thinking, and our hope. So Paul said that we have a hope because of the things we hear. So we hear it, we have hope, we protect that. We don't lose that, and that's what this helmet does for us. 
And if it fits correctly, then the blows of Satan is not going to have that great of an effect on us. Now verse 17 says, The sword of the Spirit, that is God's word. The saying is the best defense is a good offense is true in Christianity too, you know that? Because we want to be able to use God's word and we want to be able to use it correctly. We can do a lot of damage. We can see that when we go in the ministry, we talk to somebody and they think they know everything about the Bible, and it's killing them, because they think they're okay, they know exactly what the Bible teaches and in reality they haven't a clue. So they need, as the early Christian did, what does the Bible say so they can help people. And even in a literal way, those soldiers needed to take hours to learn how to use the sword. Now we know the early Christians didn't know how to use a sword, they used the Bible. But even you think about Peter, did Peter know how to use a sword? Remember he had a sword and they were in the garden of Jessman and here this slave of the high priest comes and you know if you're going to kill somebody, you have to go horizontal, because it's got to be like this. Really, I mean ZFFT. Now you know how it went with Peter. He went like this, he went sideways, because he got the guys here. Now maybe the guy was standing like this, I'm not sure. But it seems that he probably got it like this because he was just flailing, just flailing, pfft and he got his ear. But sometimes we might do that with God's word. You can't flail with God's word. We have to know how to use it and that's what Paul is saying, we want to be skilled in using the word of God. But now friends, according to what Paul is saying, we need all of those pieces because it helps us when we study, when we listen, when we prepare, and we become full grown Christians with all this body armor on to protect us and we have the mental attitude to be able to do this, keeping a simple eye, learning what to hate, learning what God wants of us. But now when we look at Ephesians chapter 6, it's kind of interesting that he says put on all these pieces of armor and then he seems to go in another direction in verse 18. Because there it says, with every form of prayer and supplication carry on prayer on every occasion in spirit. Now where did that come from? Put on all these pieces of armor and then he says, carry on prayer. Now how is that protecting us? Because that's what he's talking about, all of these things are going to protect us. Well now a soldier literally in order to know what to do and how to do it, what did they have to do? They had to get a hold of headquarters and say, what do you want me to do next? That's why Paul says put on the suit of armor and then get a hold of Jehovah and ask, what do I do next? So that's what prayer was. He was keeping in constant contact with his father. Jesus said, I've conquered the world. Paul said that he fought the fine fight to the finish and I have observed the faith. So we can do the same thing. The devil is going to scheme to do all kinds of things to break our integrity. He looks for just some small opening to get us to go in the wrong direction. But you know what? The devil is not going to kill us, he's not going to kill us. Think about it, if we are faithful, if we stay faithful and he kills us, he has lost because we stayed faithful to the end. We actually conquered the world. He doesn't want us to do that. What he wants us to do is he wants us to become tainted spiritually, he wants us to lose our spirituality, he wants us to become apostate. He wants us to live for ourselves, he wants us to listen to the world, but he doesn't want us to keep our integrity. He doesn't want us to pray. He wants us to be independent. So we have to keep on the complete suit of armor and resist the world and its temptations because we can, we can do that. Now why? Why do we do it? The prize. The prize, that's why we do it. When we conquer the world it means victory for us, it means that we have the gift of everlasting life. We have a righteous new system, never again to see all the problems we see today. We courageously keep battling. We keep ourselves apart from this old world. We know that God's war is going to remove this system forever. It means take courage because we can conquer the world. Applause. Well we want to thank you, friends, for having us in your circuit. We look forward to seeing you next year. We have a work week in a few weeks, I'm not sure, I don't think that it's on this side of the circuit though, I think it's on the B side. But we will see you next year. We'll be in your circuit for two more weeks. And thanks for letting us come into your heart a little bit and also into your neck of the woods, especially after this winter. So thank you for letting us be here with you. I think I mentioned the other day that we served in North and South Dakota and Minnesota, did I tell you that? Yeah, oh man. Happy to be here, wow. Laughter. You know, every year the brother who does the concluding comments, we are supposed to thank everybody and you say, well we did it already, we thanked them last year for all things they did.
Now if somebody does something for you today it's nice and you say thank you and then two weeks from now they do the same thing again and it's nice, do you say, I'm not going to thank you, I thanked you two weeks ago. Laughter. No, no, no. We thank them every time they do something nice for us. So there are brothers and sisters who come in here on Friday, they work all day. And then we have brothers that take care of keeping it clean and looking after us while we're here for the two days. And so we want to thank them for looking after us, don't we? Applause. Now I'm not sure how many of you friends know this, but at one time in God's organization we were told if you're going to take something, be careful. Don't set up a tape recorder in front of everybody and don't cut into the lines in the assembly hall. Well now the branch has decided, the Christian congregation, has decided that they're going to tape it for us. So there are a couple of brothers right back there, isn't that you guys? Just do this. Do this. Come on, oh it's over here, oh that's right. Okay I see, I beg your pardon. You guys are sound, they did a good job too. But these brothers over here, okay? So what they're doing is they put the whole program on a CD and then they give the CD to the coordinators of your congregations. Now any friends that didn't make it to the assembly, maybe it was because they were sick or they're older and they can't make it, or whatever, that CD is going to go around in your congregation. Now did you know that? Did you all know that? Yes, isn't that a nice arrangement? Applause. Thank your brothers for doing that, I mean it wasn't your idea, but thanks for doing it. Laughter. At the branch, that's a nice arrangement from the Christian congregation. We also want to thank Brother and Sister Woods and Brother and Sister Thea, you know they are in here every day all week looking after the place. So we want to acknowledge the fact that they work hard to make this a nice place for us when we come in on Saturday morning, so we want to thank them. Applause. Well now we can go home and just kind of review John chapter 15, verse 19, and think about being no part of the world. And so with greater enthusiasm we can share in our ministry and stay separate. Now what we're going to do is, we're going to stand and we're going to a song, it's song no. 4. Making a good name with God, taken from Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 1, which tells us that, to have a good name with God is better than good oil, and then what we'll do is that we will conclude with a prayer and thank Jehovah for our day. Song no. 4. End.